Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Welcome to Walking Through the Book of Exodus. I'm your host, Ruel Barksdale, and today we will be looking at the 25th chapter of the Book of Exodus. What a powerful chapter this is. In this particular chapter, now we, we go to a different phase. In chapters 22, 23, and 24, God has told the children of Israel how to obey his laws. In this chapter, he tells them how to worship him, how to love him. It's not enough for you to just obey me. I want you to worship me. And this is how I expect you to do it. So get your Bibles, get your paper, pencil. You're going to have to take some notes on this one. And we will get started walking through the book of Exodus, chapter 25. Now, as always, we're going to look at a few scriptures to uh, give us some contextual context, some foundation for what we're going to be looking at today. Um, and I want you to first start with, uh, let's go to ex Exodus, the 11th chapter, Exodus, the 11th chapter. Uh, now, you know, God will often give you what you need to do what he wants you to do before you know you even need it. And certainly that is the story with the children of Israel. God gives them uh, what they need before they know they need it. In the 11th chapter, on their way out of bondage, on their way out of slavery, on their way out of captivity, the Lord says to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. Now tell the people that tell the people that men and women alike are to ask their neighbors for art, articles of silver and gold. The Lord made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and Moses himself was highly regarded in Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and of the people. Now I want you to get silver. I want you to get their riches. I want you to get their precious metals. I want you to take them with you. Why, Lord? Don't worry about why. Just do what I told you to do. But, you, Lord, you're asking those that enslaved us, those that, that have brutalized us to give us their wealth. Yes, that's exactly what I'm telling you to do. Now, go do it. And they did it. And not only did they, did they walk away with precious golds and silver and, and metals, they walked away with fine linens, silks, and and all types of precious clothing. Why? Well, they would need that to build the tabernacle. They didn't know it then, but they would soon discover that God does everything in order. So a couple of uh, things I want you to notice. Um, let's go to, well, I'll just ask you to remember. Remember when um, the when they were interrogating God and were interrogating Christ, I'm sorry, and they said, well, give us the two great commandments, teacher, you know all everything. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, your love, with all your soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I want you to understand that those two that he quotes starts with the word love. Love is important to God. He wants our obedience, and he, and he told you how to be obedient in chapter 20, and then in chapter 21, 22, and 23. Chapter 24, he tells you how to be obedient, and he expects our obedience, but he expects our love. Love the Lord your God. He didn't say, he didn't say, right in that moment, he didn't say obey. He expects that, but that's not what he said when he was asked what are the greatest commandments. Love your neighbor. He, he starts with the word love. Love, 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 love. And today in the 25th chapter, he's not going to, he's going to walk away from telling us what to do. He's going to tell us how to worship him, how to love him. If you'll turn with me to St. John 3.16. Oh, it's a scripture that you've quoted. You've heard it many, many times before. But let's look at it just for a second. St. John 3.15. For God so what loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What am I saying? I'm saying that you can give without loving but you cannot love 
without giving. And in this chap, in the chapters that we just referenced, that word love is powerful, powerful, powerful. I think it was Tina Turner that that wrote the song, uh, sang the song. What's love got to do with it? Shakespeare said that love is not love which alters what alteration finds, nor bends with the remover to remove. It is an ever constant star, a guiding bark to each and every light. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, I believe, that said, love is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury and signifying nothing. And so mankind has wrestled with the concept of love. But God says, God so loved the world that he gave, he gave the best that he had. And so tonight, my brother, my sister, I, I, I want to ask, what, what are we doing with that second with that, not the obedience part. Yeah, we got that. In the first part of Exodus, uh, Exodus 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, God's telling us, obey, obey, obey. This is how I want you to obey. This is how I want you to follow the law. But can we also love him? Can we worship him? Can we honor and adore him? All right, let's go to Exodus, the 25th chapter. In this 25th chapter, now I'm going to read through this. Because in, in the following chapters, 26, 27, 28, we're going to get more specificity over the things that we read through in this chapter. So, so bear with me. We'll, we'll breeze through this. I am, however, going to give you tonight, as a matter of fact, I'll do that. I'll do that front, up front before we even read it. Um, the sanctuary is a holy place. It's a place set apart to be a meeting place with God. Now, we are not to assume that God is only in that holy place. Just are we, we are not to assume in the 21st century that God only resides in our church. As a matter of fact, our specific church, the church with our, ad, no, 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 no. God is omnipresent, which means that God is everywhere. But we're going to find that in the 25th chapter of Exodus, God is designing a specific place to commune, to communicate, to collaborate, to, to, to hear, to, to be worshipped, to be loved. I, I want you to build me a place where, where I can show you my glory, where you can feel the presence. I, I want you to build me a place. And in that place, there are four colors. The color blue, which is the color of heaven and, and eternal things. It is the rarest color in, in nature, the color purple. The color purple is actually a color of a combination of, of blue and scarlet, uh, it is the, the, which is the third color. Purple was the color of royalty and wealth and power. It was also rare and costly. The color scarlet, is, it is the color symbolizing man and blood. The Hebrew uh, word for man is Adam, and it's spelled exactly as the Hebrew word for red, white linen, uh, signifying righteousness and purity. And so in the tabernacle, you're going to see the color of heaven. You're going to see the color of royalty and power. You're going to see the color of blood. And you're going to see the color of righteousness and purity. And should not we have those, not colors, but those, those attributes in our churches today? Should we not teach about the blood? Should we not teach about purity? Should we not teach about the royalty and the power of being children of God? Should we, should we not teach about the heavens and eternal things? Yes. Yes. We're in the New Testament, but there's certain things that should always be in the sanctuary. And then we have different, um, different metals. I'm not going to touch on all of them tonight, but I would like to touch on color and the color, I'm sorry, the metal of gold and of silver and of the acacia tree, which gives us the wood for the, for the tabernacle. Gold refers to faith in the word of God. Silver refers to the grace of salvation. The acacia tree, the bark produces excellent quality gum, which, which is full of medicinal properties and, and many diseases are treated by it. The veil itself represents the boundary between heaven and earth. There ought to be some faith in our churches today. There ought to be some teaching about the grace of salvation today. 
There ought to be some healing, not just physical healing, but people ought to come to the church and, and walk away healed, walk away renewed, walk away refreshed, walk away with a revelation, walk away with the truth. We cannot, should not, must not just have social uh, experiences in our church where we come together and, and enjoy each other's company. No, no, no. God wants us to worship him. And in the 25th chapter, he's going to say specifically how to work. I know he talked about the commandments, but that's not what this chapter is about. I'll give you an analogy. Let's say for those of you who have children, your children come to you and say, Mommy, Daddy, we, we've had a meeting without you. We've decided for the rest of our lives, we're going to be completely, without hesitation, obedient to you. If you tell us to do something, we will do it. If you tell us to stop doing something, we will stop it. I, I, I can see a little tear welling up in your eye right now. Oh, how precious my children. But then they give you a caveat. Caveat, we will be completely obedient, but we will not love you. Now it's different, isn't it? And so God wants us to be obedient. And he's telling us through the Ten Commandments and and through the, the scriptures following the Ten Commandments exactly how to do that. But he wants our worship. He wants our love, our admiration. Our, he wants us to love and adore him. And in the 25th chapter, he starts to create that. All right, so let's read, let's read, let's read, let's go. Uh, Exodus, the 25th chapter, uh, verse 20, starting with verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from each man whose heart prompts him to give. Now, wait, wait, wait. Let's look at that. Let's break that down. First of all, Moses, the offering isn't for you. It's not for the children of Israel. The offering is for me. Well, God, why, why do you need an offering? Everything on earth and in the heavens is yours. The cattle on a thousand hills is yours. You speak a thing into existence that is yours. I want an offering because I want you to love me. I want you to worship me. And I want you to do it willingly. Hear that. You know, those that have a heart to do so. If your heart prompts you to do I, I don't want anybody giving me a penny out of obligation. I don't want anybody giving me a penny because they were told to stand in the $50 line and they feel embarrassed. I, I don't want that. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are, to, you are to receive the offering for me, not from you, for me, from each man whose heart prompts him to give. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Now, where, now wait a minute. These people are slaves just, just out of bondage. Where are they going to get this stuff? Guess what? We read the 11th chapter of Exodus. I want you to tell the Egyptians. I want you to tell your neighbors to give you the gold, give you the silver. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze. Blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. I want fine linen, goat hair, ram skins, dyed red, and hides of sea cows, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointed oil, and, and the fragrance in incense. I want onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod. And breastplate, we'll get all into all of that next week. Don't worry about it. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Now, Moses is coming down the mountain then. On one, on the one arm, he's got the Ten Commandments. But on the other arm, he's got the blueprints for the tabernacle for the place where he would reside as he communed with the children of Israel. I wonder, my friend, tonight, do you have a special place where you and the Lord reside, where you and the Lord communicate, where you and the Lord, where you can hear the voice of the God, where you can feel the presence of God? Do you have a place in your life, maybe in your apartment, maybe in your home, where it's just you and God, and you can love on him, and you can, yeah, yeah, he wants you to be, to be obedient, but he wants your love. He wants you to honor and adore him. Is there a place for you? Let's continue reading. He's going to tell them exactly how to build it. 
Have them make a chest of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide and a cubit uh, and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold mold, uh, molding around, cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to its four feet and, and with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make two rings, then make two poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the chest to carry it. Let me give you a, a picture of what that looks like. Uh, imagine, if you would, a long, um, a, a rectangular wooden box overlaid with gold. And on each of the sides, you have a large rings. Why? Because you're going to slide poles through that, which will enable you to carry this thing. Because I don't want you touching it. You, you've got to have the poles to separate you from, from the thing that I'm asking you to build. Don't, don't touch it, because if you touch it, you'll die. We'll get more into that as we get into the later chapters. Let's, let's read. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. Then put in the ark the testimony which I will give you. Make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide, and make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub on one end and the other and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim of one piece with with the cover at the two ends. And I'm going to put a I'm going to put a picture of this on my Facebook page for you. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. Place the cover on the top of the ark and put in the ark the testimony which I will give you. There above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the ark and the, of the testimony, I will meet with you and give you all the commands of the, for the Israelites. He's being very specific. This is exactly what I want it to look like. This is exactly how I want it to be built. These are the materials, and we're going to go through this in more detail. So I'm just reading through it tonight. Make a table of acacia wood, um, two cubits long. I, I believe I read that. Let's go down to verse 31. Make a lamp stand of, stand of pure gold and hammer it out, base and shaft. Its flower-like cups, buds, and blossoms shall be of one piece with it. Six branches are to extend from the sides of the lampstand, three on one side, three on the other. Three cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms are to be on one branch, three on one, three on the, the next branch, and the same for all six branches extending from the lampstand. And on the lampstand, there are to be four cups. Do you see the specificity? This is where I'm going to rest. This is going, where I'm going to reside. This is where I'm going to meet with you. Not that this is the only place I will be because I'm omnipresent. But this is a place where you will know you can come and feel my presence. This is a place that, that will be special for you to, to worship me, to adore me, to honor me. And on the lampstand, there are to be four cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms. One bud shall be under the first pair of branches extending from the lampstand, a second bud under the second pair, and a third bud under the third pair, six branches in all. The buds and branches shall all be of one piece with the lampstand, hammered out of pure gold. Then make its seven lamps and set them up on it so that they light the space in front of it. Its wick trimmers and trays are to be of pure gold. A talent of pure gold is to be used for the lampstand and all the accessories. See that you make them according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Don't go to the left. Don't go to the right. Don't add. Don't subtract. Moses, I'm telling you exactly how I want. Now, now you got to understand that before they got to the wilderness, God had given them the gold given them the silver. God had given them the precious yarns. God had, had given them the ability with goldsmiths and, and carpenters to make this. God will give you what you need before you know you need it. 
And he's still doing that. And isn't that a wonderful thing? And so many times, many of you are looking at, well, why do I have this gift? Why do I have that talent? Why did God give me this promotion? Why did God bless me with this? Because God gives you what he wants you to have to do what he wants you to do before you even know you need it. That's the kind of God we serve. Oh, the 25th chapter. It's not just a chapter of tabernacle. It's a chapter saying saying that, listen, I know that I told you to, to obey me, but guess what? I also want you to love me. I also want you to worship me. And I'm going to give provisions. I'm going to give directions for you to do just that. Listen, until next week, tell a friend, tell an enemy about our walk through the book of Exodus. And maybe by the time next week is over, <laughs> you and your enemy will be friends. I love you. God loves you more. Bye-bye.